guys, it's Shami here with Scaling Retail. I'm here with David Rice, the founder of Brand Black. We're over here at Agenda. Super excited to talk to you, David. There's so many interesting things happening in this industry. You've received such a great amount of press around kind of the innovations that you've done around sneakers, around this industry. I'm even most excited about on your mission statement as you talk about humanity and technology. Um, that to me, I think, is such a beautiful and eloquent way to talk about our industry, which is oftentimes not really centered around that. Yeah, it's, uh, it can get cold and calculated. It yeah. can be driven primarily by technology and then there's no sort of human connection. Mm. And so I think we try and find a way to, um, to bring a crafted element or an, an aspect that's human. So I think we like doing market travel in Japan a lot because I think that they have a really great understanding of how to connect things in a, um, there's a narrative that connects people that is spiritual, that is more than just mm. the product. And so we try and always do that. Amazing, I'd be interested to hear how many of your consumers are also practicing meditators, you know? I think that that's also become yeah. kind of like a, it's a thing now, right? It's is like, it? I don't do know. We, how do we, you don't meditate? Uh, no. I'm gonna have to send you an app. I need know? to meditate, <laughs> I need to, yeah, Jesus, the stress. You know, I think one of the things that I have found, so in my background, you know, I come from uh, the buying world at, you know, Barney's, I was at Gucci, and I have to say kind of these, this industry is not really known for its humanity, right? It's no. not really known for being heart-centered or kind of leading with um, integrity behind design and product. And, yeah. You know, that really leads me to the development of your product and really what you guys have done in the sneaker market. So talk to me a little bit about design philosophy, about product development, et cetera. So let's start with Billy who just ran off. Yes. <laughs> uh, he and I are the uh, founders and the owners of the brand. Yeah. Uh, I've been in the industry for God. I started in 1992 mm. at Fila. So I was a designer at Fila, I was a designer at Adidas, I worked at all these different companies, and people would come, actually funny story is Tony Shellman is doing this, yeah. when he had a Nietzsche. Uh, I was there at Fila when they became the uh, joint venture capitalist to invest in that brand. Interesting, yeah. And I remember they would come into my, my little tiny office and they would say, you know, what's this? And I'd be like, oh, that got dropped. What's this? That got dropped. What's this? That got dropped. What's this? That got dropped. All the coolest shoes wow. never made it out. And it was like that at every company I worked for. And I would have a vision for what I thought was interesting. And to your point about there not being a lot of humanity or not a lot of um, passion for product, it's more yeah. commerce driven, um, it was frustrating. So I felt like at a certain point, you're, you're gonna continue to complain for the rest of your life or you're gonna try and do something about it. And so that's Absolutely. why we started Brand Black in the first place, was to have a vehicle to do the products that we thought were missing from the market or the products that we felt passionate about the products that generally don't make it because they're maybe not that commercially viable, but they're interesting. Absolutely, and I feel like this is a narrative that I've heard from a lot of different creative directors and you know, small business owners where they're like, hey, these are our favorite pieces of the line and I can't believe no wholesaler picked this up because Ever. this is what we stand for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. and when it comes to what is you know, tradable as a commodity yeah. in a retail environment, versus what is the core essence of a brand, Yes. right? Oftentimes, the retailers are too scared. And beyond that, I think it can become, I think the constant challenge for uh, a brand is that a retailer has got a, uh, they've got a merchandising sort of list. And sure. you fit a specific box. Yes. And oftentimes, that isn't in line with your brand direction or brand vision. Mm. But they might say, all right, you've got all these shoes here and I think that, you know, yep. and we'll say this is the one we think is the most interesting or whatever it is and they'll say, yeah, that's great, but we need a white chunky sneaker. So that's what we're gonna buy from you guys. And uh, I think that it's important that you, you have to obviously make products that, that are sellable, that will work, but you also have to sort of, in, in a nice way, I think if you have a, a rapport or a relationship with retailers, you can say, listen, you know, I know that that's your bread and butter, but I really would like you to at least try this. If it doesn't work, we'll figure something out. But sure. let's at least, because this really speaks to what the brand is, and I think that that's important to balance those two things. If you just become a whole filler, your brand will be gone. What do you stand for, right? Yeah, I exactly. mean, like, yeah, what do you making, stand for yeah. at the end of the day? Yeah, yeah, you exactly. You might as well just be doing private might, label. I was just going to say, like, might as well just be private label. <laughs> Unfortunately, I would say that that's what the retail sort of, it's turned into that on some levels. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's what they're looking for, at least for a lot of small brands, right? They have their bread and butter, yep. large brands that are bringing home the income. But then for the small brands, they're kind of like, they'll dabble here and there, but effectively it's like, you know, where do you fit in? Absolutely, so talk to me about how your model has starting to disrupt you know, your engagements with these retailers, right? You guys have pretty wide distribution, a mm -hmm. lot of great partners in the industry. Given that you so fundamentally believe, right, kind of in this ethos of standing for brand, Talk to me about some of those difficult conversations you've had to have with some of these retailers. I, 
yeah, it's a fine line. You have yeah. to sort of, on the one hand, it is business, right? You know, that was uh, when I worked at Adidas, Peter Moore made a good line. He was talking to all the designers and he said, just so we're clear, none of us are painters. This isn't art, this is commerce. This is, interesting. you're, you're making products that sure. sell. So let's not forget that. By the same token, I think, um, it doesn't have to be a difficult conversation. I think that if you have a good rapport with a buyer, mm. they'll trust you, you know, within reason, obviously. There's some times sure. where you just can't get there, but then there's times maybe where you do have a difficult conversation after the fact and you say, you know, you steered us here, this is where we wanted to take you, this was actually our best selling shoe last season, whatever. Wow. Maybe next season, just you know, give it a shot, or if we, if we think yeah. something's strong, again, we'll work with you guys, but try something out. So I think you have to earn their trust, because at the end of the day, there is risk, and they don't want to have a turkey, you know what I mean? They no, might lose their they job don't. if they, of right, if they, yeah. So I think it's, there's a balance, and, and I think you end up can, with markdown money, yeah, and exactly. what do we do yeah, about exactly. Or, yeah, and, yeah, you know, and, and also there's the, you know, you don't want to become um, self-indulgent, right. right, and have vanity projects that you just think are, you know, it's like, I would say the, 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 the curse of a creative is to get whatever you want. Right? Once a, a recording artist has their own label and they're mm. super rich and they're super famous, then they start making shit albums after that because nobody's challenging them. They're phoning it in. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Or, or no, no, not even just phoning it in. They might be working really hard on it, but there's no, nothing's challenging their point of view. I see. Yeah. Because they're creating for the market rather than creating. No, no even like, beyond that, yeah. I just think that there's, no, even beyond that, even if it's purely creative, right. I just think that there's, I think it's important to have obstacles and the people for challenge sure. you a little bit because I think it makes, I think if you have it exactly your way, mm it's probably not that good. So you need the friction in order to develop the kind of creativity and push yourself yeah, further. Yeah, I think you need challenges. I think yeah. you need things against you or that. else, what's, you know, what are you doing? Absolutely, right? interesting. So as you guys have expanded your categories, now moving into some you know, ready to wear pieces, talk to me as in this context of now selling by category to retailers, right? They know you as this great shoe brand, they understand your aesthetic, your assortment. How has it been kind of introducing different categories and kind of getting the brand to be cohesively represented in your outlets? I think because we have a very strong brand image and I think um, we've never been just one thing. That's another dangerous, it's another dangerous game to play. There's, you know, I won't name the brands, but there's case study after case study of brands that came out, they had an item, it was incredibly successful and they can never come up with the second item and they get huge, they have that thing, and they're huge. I mean, they have the biggest booth here, and then three years later, it's gone. Right. So I think that from the beginning, because we're, you know, we just like to make stuff, and it doesn't have to, there hasn't to be a reason for it. Yeah. We've had all kinds of products. You know, we've had dress shoes, and basketball sneakers, and running shoes, and technical running shoes, and chunky sneakers, yeah. and, and weird sandal ideas. So I think anything we bring to the table, people will at least look at, because yeah. we're not really known for one thing. Got so I think it. that's a good thing. That's really interesting. Yeah. I feel like sometimes, Especially these days, we hear a lot about you know uh, being really niche or being really focused. But yeah. you're absolutely right from the standpoint of you're either pushing forward a brand value or a brand vision, yeah. right? Or you're kind of focusing on an item-driven product, yes, right? And yes. an item-driven brand. And when you become item-driven, yeah, you can be hot or not, right? Exactly. And it's not always dependent on you. Yeah, yeah. And the brands, and obviously, an item is what makes a brand. I mean, yeah. every brand is identified by usually an item, whether it's a Levi's jean or an Air Force One yep. or a Stan Smith or whatever it is. But there are other items that they have that are strong. And that's Support the difference the between business. them and the ones that went away. Absolutely. That they had the one shoe, you know what I mean? Amazing. Yeah. So talk to me a little bit about scale and what that means to you, you know, as a business that's growing, as you look at different KPIs and metrics to help you understand kind of the next five years or the areas in which you want to pivot into. I know you can't disclose everything, um, but in terms of what scale means to you and how you're pushing your visions forward. So it means, I think it's a, it's a, it's a big world. Yep. There are, you don't have to saturate markets to scale. I think that you could still be quite focused, but be in a lot of territories mm. and have a, a, a great business. I also think, and I think everybody's been talking about this, that vertical is the future. Yep. I think that with social media and engagement with your customer and the challenges that retail is having, and the fact that they've built in various mechanisms to protect mm -hmm. them that are always at the expense of the brand, sure. right? It's, I need a discount, I need it on wheels, yeah. I need, you know, whatever, net 45, I need this, I need this, and take this back, it didn't work. And it's like, it's really hard to be successful from a, from a bottom line standpoint, from a margin standpoint, when you have to do all of that. So I think that that's why many brands are focusing, you know, 45 to 55% on being vertical because yep. you get your margins back. You can also sort of control the conversation. You can have launches, you can do things. Experiment that you, more. You yeah, can really yeah, create yeah. a connection exactly, with your exactly, consumer. Exactly, exactly, exactly. I think one of the things that we're 
not great at yet that, our, that we're, we're trying to really, because our, our vertical part is not great. And I think beyond that, I think um, I'm seeing finally the, the, the initial fissures and fractures in the sort of seasonal sailing. That's yep. starting to break up, and I think vertical is yeah. a great way to just boom, boom, boom. Because at the end of the day, we look at our Instagram, and we're bored. Yes, absolutely. After three days, you know what absolutely. I mean? Absolutely. So dropping five colorways at once, which is the way it used to happen, is kind of uh, uh, an anachronism. It's old school, yeah. yeah it I mean, work. the new school is like, how often are you able to capture that attention? Exactly. What right? are, yeah, what's new on brand black? You know, is yeah. there something new? And so we could be better at that. We could yeah, do a good you job know, I think that. it's fascinating as we look to see the synthesis between you know, our sales and our marketing and our merchandising strategies, you know? And yeah. I think that that's something that, you know, back at Scaling Retail, we're always working with our clients on how are you timing out your deliveries and your drops with your marketing initiatives? Yeah. How are you collecting that data and pushing out to your retail stores what those collections should look like, you know, based on your own internal data? Yeah, I would, selling? you know, having worked <laughs> at big companies, yeah. I wish I had the luxury of being that strategic, unfortunately, yeah. because it's, you know, I mean, the team is so small, it's a joke. How many people are in the team? Right now? Yes. Oh my God! <laughs> I love that. Billy and I do everything. Everything. Wow. Yeah, I and mean, we have outsourced wow. we have yes. outsourced things, right? Yeah, of that, course. that we have obviously of course. you know, bookkeeping and back end and, and that stuff. But effectively it's there's the two, two of, of us. You. Yes. So on any given day, I've yeah. got a thousand emails and they'll be everything from some guy wanting to return a shoe from four years ago to right. shipping to whatever. So it can be challenging to be strategic or to be very creative mm. when you're, you're, there's so much. So then how do you mentally, kind of, this would be really interesting to our audience because a lot of them are also companies of two, right? And yeah. they're, they're trying to figure out how to achieve um, even having this size of a booth here, right? And yeah. being able to kind of get to these next metrics. You know, when you're looking at allocating your time, obviously you're an industry veteran, so as far as, you know, understanding how things work and operate, you bring a great deal of experience to the table. But even in terms of just managing your time and how you're allocating your resources, what is going on in your thought process, right, on a daily basis? On a daily basis, I wake up early and then I start to just bang out, you know, all the annoying emails, all the stuff that has to be taken care of right away. Yeah. And then there will be a chunk where I'll be, you know, I, I break it into segments, so there'll be, Email guy, finance guy. Yep. <laughs> I'll be technician for a couple of hours working on toe cap reinforcements or whatever the factory wants. Got it. And then during design season, I will say that I'll volley everything to Billy and I'll be like, I have to just shut off and design footwear and then he'll design the apparel and he'll, he'll and we'll, we'll, we'll volley. Okay, got so there'll it. So there'll be times where you do have to just be in the trenches and just focus on product. With that said, I think he and I were talking this trip about Next season, we're going to try a, a, a new process, okay. a more collaborative process with people that we really like in the industry that we oh, think fun. are really yeah. cool, and a less, um, I'm type A, I'm super controlling, I send super detailed specs out with like, you know, just everything. Yeah. And I'd like it to be a little more open, and I think mm. considering how little time we have, I think it's like guerrilla warfare. It's an opportunity yeah. for us to actually be better and more interesting. So I think, you know, that's important. Take advantage of what your limitations can be your strengths if you're if you're yeah, if you have again, a good going mindset. Back to friction, right? It's yeah, like exactly. You, you exactly. You put up some constraints. Exactly. And all of a sudden, now yeah. you have to do more with less. Yeah, I'm and you not end working. Up being the most innovative. I'm not working for things. Nike or Adidas. I don't yeah. have four shoes a season. Right. And that's my only job. All right. I do is sweat this line. Yeah. I mean, that's 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 yeah. how it gets. You know what I mean? Yeah, so of it's course. nice. There of is course. something sort of cool about being able to just, you know, it's like being a. Uh, 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 What's it called in jazz? Impro improvising jazz. Yeah. You know, you just go out there and just bang yeah. it out. Yeah, that's really fascinating. I yeah. mean, I think the attention to detail is probably also something that your customers, both on the retail and direct to you know direct to consumer, also really appreciate and value. Right, that technology and the humanity of your time and energy yeah. and effort that goes into it. Right. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you never want to let them down. Or you connection. never want to put something crap out. You know. Yeah. Just don't. Absolutely. Yeah. And so, as far yeah. as your kind of factory partners and testing out factories and testing out production. I don't know if you can tell me this, but how many factories had, did you have to test out before you landed on like your production partners? We had, we continue with this one factory that we started with in the very beginning only okay. because it was a timing thing. Uh, but the second factory that I was introduced to is insane. They're, you know, way too big and wow. too cool for such a, well not too cool, but way too big and organized for such a small brand. We have great relationships because we've been in the industry for a long time. Yeah. And so they allow us to, you know, have embarrassingly low numbers. Uh, favors, right? Yeah, it's exactly, good to, like, exactly, benefit exactly. Time is exactly, you can call in exactly. Favors. But with that said, you have to be careful. I mean, we can't. You know, there's times where I'd like to be like, "Come on, guys," but yeah. I can't because I know at the end of the day they can just tell me, "Hey, if you don't like it, 
Bye bye. Yeah. yeah, and I feel so. like that's a really tight space that a lot of, again, brands that are growing kind of get into this issue of, I want to be super innovative, I want to come out with more products, I want to do it faster, but I'm also working with factories that are working with huge volume, yeah. right? And they have like their priorities. Yes, And exactly. being able to kind yeah. of be really nice and you know get get well, your stuff in there. Once again, though, I think we started. I think this season I started thinking. All right, these are our actual limitations. I can't change that. It is what it is. Yeah. So how do we take that and turn that into an opportunity to to do some interesting things? So if you sure. have a more limited palette of materials, a more limited palette of colors, that might be an opportunity to do some really interesting things. Yeah. You know, so that's that's kind of where we're at because I can't deal with another uh, minimum order quantity yeah, debit note I know, from the factory. I know. I oh know, my god. I know. And then the vendors it's, at a certain point are just like, I'm not going to send you any more material. I won't yeah, do it. Yeah. Yeah. Of so course. you got to be careful. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So yeah. then, as far as you know, looking again at you know being a small team, doing everything right. Mm -hmm. Certainly, you're not having a Tim Ferriss four-hour work week, right? It's um, it's a long hustle. It's a yeah, long day. It's a lot. It's a lot of WeChat uh, starts at four th uh, four thirty in the afternoon. Yep. And goes until you know eleven at night. Yep. Absolutely. Every so day. as far as you know, what I'm curious about are. What are the technologies that you are, or apps, or things that you are integrating into your life to help make shit easier, right? I mean, do you have any, are you using any special, like, you know, I mean, you're small, but any, like, ERP systems? Any, no, you know, um, I was looking yeah. at, uh, you know, some guy reached out to me with, um, oh, yeah, I forgot what it's called, but it's one of those, uh, one of those development programs that sort of integrates everything. Yeah. I think that would be great. I think right now, we're pretty, yeah. pretty basic. Okay. I, I would say the only thing that is, really helped us is just stupid iCloud Drive. Because yeah, at least I have all my documents on every device that I'm on. Yeah. So if I'm on the fly, I'm at an airport, I can send people files or whatever it is, and yeah. you know, that helps a lot. Being on the cloud, yeah. Being on the cloud, yeah, yeah. And having access to, being on an iOS device, but having access to actual files, not just, right. you know, I can right. send yeah. actual files. Yeah, that's yeah. really important. You know, yeah. I think, you know, some of my favorite technologies, and I don't know if you ever use Boomerang, but you know, oh my God, Boomerang is the best. So basically, you could be up at two o'clock in the morning banging out emails, and you can schedule the email to go out. Oh, like, when you want at it to. another time. Oh. Yeah, yeah. It's like one of my favorites because it's a great way to like not only hit someone in their time zone. Yes. Right? Because like, yes. if you're writing to China or yeah, wherever yeah, yeah. or Japan, you're like, okay, do I really have to get up at that time to right. like write right. that email? Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, and Boomerang is so awesome because you write the email, schedule it to go whenever. Um, you can also set a timer. I'm like, Boomerang, sponsor me. Now, you can also send a timer so that that email uh, comes back up to the top of your inbox at a certain time. Oh, that would be good too. So then your, your to-do list on who to write back yes. becomes like implicit kind of in your email organizational system. Yeah, I have just flagged emails. I know. Those, Those are the ones that are on fire yeah. and the rest of them I just, yeah. you know, try and get to. I get to try Boomerang. I think they can yeah. all help. I'll get there. All right, so any, any parting words, you know, our audience, again, they're growing, they're looking to you for advice. Words of encouragement, red warning, you know, red flag warnings, like, what are you doing? You know, why are you doing this? Um, uh, anything that you can share? It's a lot harder than you think. <laughs> uh, it is rewarding. You gotta really want it, how about that? Yeah. No one's giving you anything. You know, I think that, it, especially if you've come from big brands, it's pretty plush. It's pretty yeah. easy. And I think when, you're, when you go out mm. on your own, it's just a it's grind. Okay. It's a grind. So as long as you're willing and committed to doing that, you're fine. Like I, I, I talked to my lawyer uh, a month ago because I had, you know, I couldn't get an LC. I had to take the last of my savings and put it in the LC. Yeah. And I said, have I lost my mind? Like, is this has this gone too far? He goes, you lost your mind as soon as you started a brand. This is just part yeah, exactly. of the course. This, this is, is just like, it is what it is. How it goes. Yeah, that's Absolutely. how it goes. So as long as you've that's made that goes. decision, just. Go, you gotta write it. You gotta write it. You gotta it. see yeah, yeah. it all Don't give to up. the end. Don't give Amazing. up. Amazing. One last question, you know, in terms of like friends and family support, just in terms of like mental support, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I often find that um, sometimes people overlook uh, who they spend time with, you know, yeah. as really like adding value. As an entrepreneur, as you've mentioned, it's like, it's a grind, it's a hustle, it can suck, it can also be amazing. What kind of role does uh, do your friends and family play in like keeping you sane? Yeah, they have to be yeah. a support system, they have yeah. to be, um, I think they have to be in line with, with what your goals are because if you have somebody close to you that is questioning what you're doing, yeah. when everything else is almost impossible, the last thing you need is that your your core yes. to not be in line with what you're doing. Yeah. So I agree, yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. an important thing. All right, guys, that's all from us here. Thank you so much for your Thank time you. and energy. Um, really excited to see all the new shit you guys are continuously coming out with um, and to see the business expand and grow. This is 
an amazing booth, great collection. Thank you again. I think your words of wisdom around the hustle, around what it takes, around just the sheer fact that starting a business is already insanity, right? So the fact that you're like, I want to do this, <laughs> you're already yeah. in the crazy house, so right? So you might as well just you go all the way. You might as well ride it out, just all right? Nuts. The yeah. insane asylum is big enough for all of us here at Agenda. All right, guys, thank you so much. Talk to you soon. Bye.